Hello and welcome to this Backup Academy track, vSphere 5.5 New Features and Tips. My name is Rick Vanover and I'm a Product Strategy Specialist at Veeam Software, sponsors of Backup Academy, and I'm going to be presenting this track to you today. If you're on Twitter, you can follow me on Twitter at Rick Vanover, and I also tweet on behalf of Veeam at Veeam. I'm one of the contributors at the Veeam blog and some other blogs that we're going to talk about here in a second. I have worked a lot with VMware vSphere technologies and I have vExpert status for four years now as well as a VMware certified professional credential and a Microsoft certification. Let's take a quick moment and just give you some information about me. I did mention that I do work for Veeam. I do have vExpert status, VMware vCP, and Microsoft certified IT professional status. Now, I also blog externally, and that's one of my uh, passions, if you will. I blog the Everyday Virtualization blog at virtualizationreview.com, and I also contribute to the Data Center blog at Tech Republic. That's a great way for me to stay in tune to things beyond just Veeam, but the greater virtualization tr uh, community at large. So I hope you enjoy this track. Let's go ahead and get started. So let's first start with a quick little agenda of what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about the version and the sequencing of the products associated with vSphere 5.5, as well as some of the tips in terms of upgrades and the features that go along with it, because there's so much to the product that you really have to know what you're getting into and how to go about using it. We're then going to talk about two ways of going about testing it, nested ESXi and Autolab. I'm also going to jump into a live recorded video where you can see how to use the different components of vSphere 5.5 so that you can go about your upgrade successfully. Lastly, we're going to round out with some great community resources. It's all about the community and there's plenty of those resources available to you. Let's first discuss what vSphere 5.5 is. vSphere 5.5 starts with the hypervisor, which is VMware ESXi. You may have heard of that. There may be an additional component in use called the vCenter server application, which we'll talk about as well. But let's focus on what vSphere 5.5 does. Basically, it's a virtualization platform that has a lot of features that you can use in your data center. Now, uh, let's take a look at this figure. I have eight virtual machines, four ESXi hosts, three shared storage resources. This is entirely a sample. Your mileage may vary, your configuration may be bigger, smaller, might be all Linux, might be all Windows, it doesn't matter. You get the picture that we can have a lot of different applications, uh, file servers, email, databases, directory services, Linux, Windows. I, I don't even remember the number of guest virtual machine operating systems that are supported on ESXi, but it's incredible pretty much any operating system that has ecosystem support will be a supported operating system for vSphere 5.5. So those operating systems are contained inside of this ESXi hypervisor on shared storage. Now when you contain an operating system within a computer, basically what that means is it's effectively a computer within a computer. So in this example, we have 10 different virtual machines on four ESXi hosts on three shared storage resources. From a compute, memory, network, and storage perspective, all of those individual virtual machines have everything they need. They have connectivity, they have CPU resources, they access memory as needed, and they write to disk as if they were installed on native hardware. But ESXi is the hypervisor, brokers that um, I.O., the CPU network, all those different resources across the other virtual machines. There can be performance guarantees through something called DRS, which is the Distributed Resource Scheduler, which will ensure that individual VMs get the slice of the infrastructure they need for the performance that they want. HA, another great technique, basically it can say in this example that these 10 virtual machines need to stay running in case one of these individual hosts were to fail. Basically then they could restart those virtual machines on another host. VMFS is a uh, storage technique, a proprietary clustered file system that you can run virtual machines from an ESXi host 
And I actually spent a lot of time getting used to VMFS when I first started with vSphere. That was new to me. I lived in a direct attached storage world. As I virtualized, I also made the transition to shared storage, and I found that virtualization and storage are very much uh, a related conversation. Uh, you Chances are, as you go through your virtualization journey, you'll learn a lot more about storage and the clustered file system of VMFS, as well as some of the other advanced storage features that are specific in vSphere 5.5 are actually improving uh, more than I can keep up with, and I'm sure you'd agree. So in the high level, I just want to paint a picture of what ESXi and vSphere 5.5 are. Not everyone has been familiar with them. Hopefully this is a great place for each of us to start. So I mentioned earlier that vSphere is a collection of products. Now VMware has many products. In fact, many products are even built around vSphere and specifically built around ESXi. You may have heard of the vCloud Suite or vCloud Director, vShield Security Manager, all kinds of other products. For most of what we're going to talk about in this track, I'm going to focus on two main products. ESXi, the hypervisor, which is at vSphere 5.5, and the vCenter server application, which is also at vSphere level 5.5. So together, the hypervisor, ESXi, and the vCenter application are really the base of what vSphere is. Now, on the 22nd of September 2013, we had both the vCenter server application and the hypervisor released. And you can see the release notes here on the screen that have the build numbers and their associated dates. Now, when it comes to the vCenter server application, this can exist in two different ways. We're going to talk about this in a little bit, but basically the vCenter server application can exist as a Windows installable app, which if you've uh, been playing with VMware technologies for a while, Virtual Center and then vCenter server was installed on Windows exclusively up until recently they've delivered a Linux based appliance the vCenter server appliance. Now there's a growing focus towards that appliance but for now it's available in two different ways. Now if you were keeping score you may have noticed on the 31st of October there was a new release of the vCenter server application 5.50a now, if you haven't started your update, go ahead and get the A release. If you downloaded right when it came out, which I do, most people do as well, but haven't done anything with it yet, chances are you want to go ahead and re-download that. Now you can look at VMware.com in the downloads slide uh, area where you will find what you can download and it also has the specific build numbers. In fact, I'll show you that on the next slide here. But basically, when it comes to downloading, you want to download the hypervisor, which you would update with Update Manager, but vCenter Server as an application doesn't actually update the same way. So if you're using Update Manager, you can bring ESXi up to a newer build, but when it comes to the vCenter Server application, you want to go ahead and download that latest version if you haven't started yet already. So as I was discussing on the previous slide, when you download vSphere, make sure you look at the release date right here. You can see it very clear. ESXi 5.5 was on the 22nd of September, and then on the 31st, you'll see vCenter Server 5.50a. So make sure you get the latest one if you have it started right when you download from VMware.com. So before you upgrade, I'm actually convinced that a lot of people upgrade because of new features. And when it comes to vSphere 5.5, I actually wrote a blog right here on Backup Academy about the top features of vSphere 5.5. These were my features. Of course, you guys know about Backup Academy because you're here. But these were the features that I thought were very important to my needs as a virtualization professional and to what I think may be uh, overlooked uh, by some of the other users in the community. But before you jump into an upgrade, it's very clear that you identify what you're trying to do. Sure, you might upgrade to vSphere 5.5 for the latest operating system support. For example, Windows Server 2012 is much more clarified support in vSphere 5.5. Uh, it works a lot better. You could kind of jam it in there in previous versions, but now it works pretty good, and I bl believe it's an officially supported guest operating system. Same goes for uh, some storage features, which I'll talk about here in a second. But 
you know, don't upgrade just, you know, because it's upgrade. Make sure you have a good reason, but more importantly, know what you're getting into. Because sometimes features go away, sometimes supported operating systems go away. For example, NT4.0 is no longer a supported operating system. It doesn't mean it won't work, but just it's not on the compatibility list anymore which is also a good resource to check out because storage again comes up as a new feature a lot of the features for vSphere 5.5 are around storage what do you do when you buy storage for vSphere you check the hardware compatibility guide well a lot of these new features don't have all of the products from vSphere 5.1 or even maybe vSphere 4.0 Maybe some of those products aren't on the compatibility guide for vSphere 5.5. It might be worth a look just to make sure your entire environment is supported. So it's really tough to kind of containerize everything to consider, but hopefully I'm giving you some ideas on what may come up in your upgrade or migration project. Now some of the features I'm going to talk about only apply to the newest version of the virtual machine hardware, hardware version 10. Now, an individual VM, if you remember back to the, the graphic we had earlier, has a certain number of uh, attributes, in fact, a great number. They're uh, very specific for every edition of ESXi. So when I started my virtualization practice, it wasn't a big deal on VMware Workstation. It, it may have tracked a version, but I didn't really notice it because I didn't really care about the features. But as I grew into vSphere and VI3 way back in the day, and like, ESX3 era, right? We had hardware version 4. Then vSphere 4 came out with hardware version 7. It's been quite a quick cadence of releases over the years. The latest version, vSphere 5.5, uses virtual machine hardware version 10. And it's important to note, if you have a mix of these different hardware versions in place, some features may not be fully supported across all of the different versions. So when you deploy a new virtual machine and you want to latch on to some of these new features, like the virtual machine disk file that can be larger than 2 terabytes now, it must only be done in hardware version 10. Further, some of these things may only be done in the web client, which I'll talk about that at length in here in a moment. So it's important to take this in, into consideration for everything, from your backups to your deployments, even your templates that you deploy. You want to make sure that everything is the correct version. You get a lot of choices when you deploy a new VM. What version do you want it to be? You might not even know what that means. When you deploy a virtual machine, if you select the latest version, be advised that that'll have access to all of those new features, but the moment you try to move it to an older host, you might get stuck. So keep that in mind uh, if you are moving virtual machines across different environments, even across clusters. That's where you might get really stuck to older vCenters and such. But everything starts with the individual VM hardware version. vSphere 5.5 introduces hardware version 10. Now, I hinted at this before, but there is a new virtual disk geometry that's supported with the VMDK disk format. Basically, virtual disks can now be up to 62 terabytes in vSphere 5.5. This is a great, great piece of news. This platform, vSphere, supports pretty much any operating system, any application, but sometimes we get into situations where we need larger data profiles. The, the VMDK had a previous limit of around 2 terabytes, which was just unfortunately not big enough for some of the data profiles we have to manage. Now, 62 terabytes is a lot of data, and I hope you don't have a lot of them that go up to that limit. But I do want to caution you in a couple areas. For one, you may want to use the thin provisioning capability in vSphere 5.5. It's a great way to have room to grow up to 62 terabytes, but not fully consume that right, at what, right away. Now, the problem here is that you may do this in the form of a template, and if you deployed 100 virtual machines, thin provision to 62 terabytes, and let's say we're talking Windows Server 2012, they might be about 15 gigabytes approximately, or more or less, depending on your config. So they may only use 16 gigabytes when they're deployed, but they may, from a thin provisioning standpoint, be able to consume 62 terabytes. Just be advised, if they actually grow, it could be a, quite a large problem that you may have uh, not 
enough storage space. But it's important to note that the 62 terabyte VMDK really makes everything else easy the rest of the way in your virtualization journey. And let me explain what I mean by that. So if you ran into that 2 terabyte uh, limit, you had to get creative in getting around that. Everything from virtual disks that were uh, connected via dynamic disk of the guest operating system. It, it solved a problem, but honestly, it wasn't really ideal. Another trick may have been raw device mappings in physical mode. And you know what? That might not be ideal either. The reason why is that actually unvirtualizes some of the virtual machine, which is kind of anti-mission statement in a way. Another trick that you may have leveraged is to uh, use an iSCSI initiator inside of the guest virtual machine, right? Maybe you have loaded the iSCSI initiator, connected it to a target on an actual SAN, and then from there, given that LUN to that virtual machine and formatted the disk and used it right away, that also is somewhat of a problem, especially if you're thinking about backups. If you talk about an image level backup, which we've covered in some of the area uh, in the other tracks here, that makes that iSCSI LUN not part of the virtual machine. So give some consideration to some of the anomalies that may have come up over the years to make the 62 terabyte really help re-standardize re in a sense that all virtual machines can really be deployed in a consistent way and fully be contained within the vSphere environment. They're easy to support in terms of you don't have these disks occasionally that are dynamic, you don't have these external LUNs which you really can't see by the way inside of the vSphere web client and you don't have to worry about physical mode or raw device mappings. All kinds of things are seriously made easier with the 62 terabyte VMDK and you can only get that if you've done the upgrade to ESXi 5.5, you're using the new virtual machine hardware 10, and of course you've got a newer uh, a storage device that can of course see that. Now the next of my top features that I've identified for vSphere 5.5 is improved scalability of the vCenter server appliance. Now I hinted at this earlier with the additions and their associated versions, but the vCenter server appliance is a simple solution that literally just works. Now what is this? It's a containerized deployment on a small Linux operating system that has the vCenter server application pre-configured, ready to go. You literally go into the admin web page, which runs at port 5480, go through a few steps, and you're on your way. Now, you have to remember these steps. Uh, you could just turn it on, but you want to make sure you get your DNS right in the application. You want to join it to the domain, get the IP set, then run the application configuration wizard. There's a few steps that you can do inside of there, but I like to do them in that order because then the application configuration goes with all of those things correctly configured. That is uh, usually taken for granted in the Windows mode because you just have all that ready to go on the Windows environment, but the appliance works a little bit different in that realm. I like to connect things to Active Directory. That's fully supported on the appliance. Uh, most features are supported on the vCenter server appliance. Uh, they are working very diligently to bring everything up to date. Uh, I know one feature like SRM, for example, is not supported on the appliance. But for what I use in most of my development and test environments, I don't need SRM. Uh, I really just need you know the basic functionality. And especially if you're in a lab, Definitely consider the vCenter server appliance. It's grown up quite a bit with vSphere 5.5, and in my own professional experience, I can tell you, this appliance just works. And uh, you don't want to spend your time managing the database of SQL Server uh, in the Windows edition, so you might as well consider the appliance going forward. Uh, it is important to note there is no migration from the Windows um, installation to the vCenter server appliance. So from a data perspective, you would not be able to take over your history, your configuration, any roles that you've assigned. Of course you can re-inventory the host and the data and the VMs will all come back in. But your vCenter config would not go with you on that transition should you want to migrate from the Windows application to the vCenter server appliance. Additional features in vSphere 5.5 that made my list of favorites include enhancements on vCenter single sign-on. 
So vCenter single sign-on is kind of a hard thing to grasp. And I know this because many people I talk to haven't upgraded their VMware environment from 4.1 or 4.0 simply because they haven't needed to. Well, now with the VMDK equal to 62 terabytes and other features, maybe it's time or uh, newer operating support, for example. One of the things you're going to find as a surprise is vCenter single sign-on. So I put it as a top feature, but honestly, it's probably the biggest learning curve you're going to have in your upgrade. Let's first talk what is single sign-on. So single sign-on is a construct. Basically it's an inter-communication construct across multiple components of the vCloud suite. Now I mentioned the vCloud suite includes I think it's 12 or 13 different quote unquote products but basically they all kind of go through ESXi, vCenter and then optionally into other modules. Now single sign-on may sound awfully familiar right maybe in my organization I have a single sign-on and it's Active Directory well Active Directory can be used with vCenter it always has and hopefully always will but when it comes to single sign-on it can't explicitly use Active Directory and let me tell you why the reasoning here is that the product ESXi and then vCenter are components of very large other use cases through providers, hosters, multi-tenant environments, and in some of those what they call air gap situations where there's absolutely no connectivity to other organizations that might even be on the same host, you can't imply that Active Directory trusts or anything like that would be used across organizations. So having single sign-on kind of broker all of that from the pure infrastructure level really is the way to do that. So it is a learning curve, and yes, it's been improved in vSphere 5.5, but I do encourage you, when you go through your upgrade or your new deployment, take some time, make a test lab, and we'll talk about that in a second, but go through the drills so that there's no surprises when you go to the newer platforms that started in vSphere 5.1, but there's no surprises for you in regards to single sign-on. So you can still do everything you want to do. It's going to take you a little bit to figure it out, but just go into your upgrade fully prepared and I don't think you're going to have any issues. Now I've identified two additional vSphere 5.5 features that I really like. One of them you may have heard of, one of them you may have not. So PDL Auto Remove, which is in the release notes, is one of those features that many people may glance over. I really liked PDL Auto Remove because PDL Auto Remove solves a real problem I have. Basically, PDL stands for Permanent Device Loss Auto Remove. It takes a block storage device out of an ESXi host if it were to truly fail. Now, the correct way to remove storage is to put the host in maintenance mode, evacuate all the VMs, uh, right click on the data store, assuming that all other VMs are evacuated, right click on it and say delete. Well, if a storage device fails, we can't always do it that cleanly. And this is a feature that will really help you not have the host littered with reconnects and, and trying to get to a device that's no longer there. It will simply remove it. Good stuff. Now, the other feature I wanted to talk about here is a great uh, technique that you can use to get some increased performance without a huge amount of investment. And that's the vSphere Flash Read Cache. So basically, the vSphere Flash Read Cache allows you to put non-rotational storage like an SSD inside of a host so that you can put a, uh, a block of cache on the host assigned to this flash read capability and one or more VMDKs as they're deployed on newer hosts can leverage this flash read cache for improved I.O. Now on this screen here you'll see that VMDK2 on the right has the flash read cache configured for its VMDK and VMDK1 does not. So if disk 2 was a database that might be a great way to give it an inexpensive boost in performance. This particular feature 
you know, I don't know the best practice here, but there's a real option that small businesses can get the benefit of non-rotational storage like SSDs without ripping and replacing everything in place. Simply put, you could actually put on local storage, local arrays of every host, one or more SSDs. It's not too expensive in the small uh, say you know sub 100 gigabytes range nowadays if you could put one or two on there and assign a cache to that that can make a huge difference in your storage read performance with effectively very little cost sure the bulk of your virtual machines will you know live on your rotational storage and while it would be nice to have everything as SSDs it's not quite possible for everyone just yet maybe putting one or more hosts uh, 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 in play with some SSDs and allowing them to use the flash read cache might be a feature that might make sense for you today. So I encourage you to read up and then test on that feature to see if it makes sense for you. Now it wouldn't be fair if I talked about vSphere 5.5 and didn't identify some of the gotchas that you may experience. So I talked about a lot of the new stuff. Let's talk about some areas where you might get stuck. The first of which is that the vSphere APIs for data protection, which were covered in some of the other Backup Academy tracks here, those are now 64-bit only. So what that means is if you've built components uh, that use things like HotAd or DirectSAN, etc., well, those might not work now if they're on a 32-bit OS. So uh, make sure that you don't have any uh, like Windows Server 2003 R2 kind of older systems that are doing your backups for example the vSphere APIs for data protection are explicitly used for backups and we talked about those at length in the other track be advised they're now 64-bit only now when it comes to vSphere I like to spend a lot of my time in the vSphere client historically now I'm going to be spending a lot more of my time in the vSphere web client or both. When it comes to the new features, some of them are only configurable in the web client. So be advised that you might want to take some time, go through the drill, make the transition to the web client. It's uh, difficult, but once you get to using it, it's actually pretty good. You also can leverage Power CLI to do a lot of your administrative tasks. In fact, that would be the enterprise thing to do. The other gotcha to identify is that uh, I pointed this out a couple times already, but the vCenter server application, both in the Windows install and the appliance, was issued in the A revision on Halloween which was a, a, a month or so after the base release but again if you haven't started go ahead and download the A version of vCenter server appliance windows etc that way you'll just go ahead and start with the latest and greatest it's not worth upgrading from the 5.5.0 to 5.5.0a unless of course you're directed that way from VMware support or such but I always like to start with the latest and greatest now again I talked about single sign-on it is a learning issue there's a good blog post here at VMware.com about backwards compatibility with SSO I encourage you to read that ahead of any upgrade you do just to make sure your expectations are level set on what you'll face in the upgrade process in the area of any gotchas. So that being said, set up a test environment and you'll be ready to go. So let's talk about the upgrade process. The first thing to remember is that VMware KB 205-7795 is the best place to start for this upgrade. You can find a short URL to it here on the right, but basically if you have more than one product from VMware in play, this is a great way to identify the prerequisite steps. If you're using vCloud Director, if you're using vCenter Server, if you're using SRM, if you're using vShield Endpoint, there's a sequence you need to apply and it's spelled out in detail in this KB. Now, if you're only using vCenter Server and ESXi, your path is a little bit more simple, which is good. Let's talk about that. So the first step always in this situation is to upgrade the vCenter Server application. Uh, especially if you're on the Windows version, you just uh, run the install right on top and it'll detect the database and, and walk you through it. Pretty straightforward. Always have a backup ahead of your upgrade. The next thing to remember is upgrading the ESXi hosts has to happen. 
Now that's done a number of ways. You can uh, throw the ISO on the host and, and do it directly and uh, wipe it away, which is kind of nasty. You could also use Update Manager, which is a great way to do it in an automated format. You can stage up the image and then push it out. Uh, same goes for VMware tools and the virtual machine hardware mach machine version. I would always recommend using Update Manager. That's a great technique to do updates on hosts and VMs within vCenter server. Good stuff. Now this last tip, upgrade VMFS data stores. This is actually a tip you won't see you know, documented in many places, but think about this. If you have a VMware environment that has had ESXi3, ESXi4, uh, through the years many different servers and storage may have come and gone, you might have some very old data stores especially consider virtualized storage where uh, LUNs can move around, right? It might be on an old version of VMFS. It might be on an old controller that maybe the storage administrator would like to have back. Maybe take some time to say, you know what, this data store needs to go, or I'm just going to reformat it. Those types of things are all, also a really good idea in the realm of house cleaning for your VMware environment, but Additionally, you can get everything consistent. For example, new data stores, if you deploy them on VMFS 5, they have a block size of 1. If you had old data stores on VMFS 3, you could upgrade them to VMFS 5, but they may have a block size of 2, 4, or 8, which are actually not even an option on new data stores. Now, I'm for consistency. So if you have a chance to clean up your data stores, maybe send them back to your storage team and say, I'm going to give you this LUN back, but then I'm going to turn around and ask you for a new one. Maybe it could be smaller, maybe it could be on better performance. It's probably a good time to consider something like that. When it comes to actually performing an upgrade, I'm a big fan of knowing what you're getting into. And I was very happy when this new VMware Fling project was released that provides VMware tool support for nested ESXi. Nested ESXi is, is kind of a hard thing to explain. But imagine that you had an ESXi host and one of the guest virtual machines within there was another ESXi host. That's a great way to test things like upgrades, things like um, how to configure special settings on clusters and hosts without the risk of doing it on your production host. So I really encourage you to leverage the VMware Fling technology uh, that provides tools on nested ESXi. And I wrote a blog post about it. You can see the link right down there. But basically what this does is it delivers a VIB of, uh, it's a module that installs inside of VSXi that provides VMware tools. So this will allow cleaner migrations, cleaner shutdowns. Probably, I don't really care if it provides better performance. I just want it to be a cleaner virtual machine. Before it was a complicated mesh of unsupported options to get this to work. Now it's uh, it's not really ready for production. Again, it's a test technique, but it goes in very nicely. So. Along with this, there's also a defined guest operating system type of ESXi, as you can see on the screen. I am using the Windows client, not the web client, so hopefully you'll f forgive me for that. Now, aside from nested ESXi and, and the KB, another tool that you can use in the virtualization community to prepare for your upgrade, as well as learning new uh, VMware features is the Autolab. If you haven't heard of Autolab, I encourage you to go to labguides.com forward slash Autolab. Basically what this is, is it's a containerized version of everything you need to test ESXi, vSphere, and other technologies without even providing a rich, uh, high-performance environment. In fact, it can even be run on many laptops. They document the requirements. I think it starts as little as 8 gig of RAM, and you can try this on a PC, on a laptop, even on an ESXi host, VMware workstation. Many of these things can be even done for free. So I encourage you to check this out if you haven't done so already. So let's now jump into my lab here. We're going to take a look at a live vSphere 5.5 environment, and I'm going to narrate through some of the things related to what I've shown you already thus far in the track. Okay, let's take a look inside of a vSphere 5.5 environment. If you're not familiar with the web client, it has everything you might need 
that you have used before in the vSphere web client for Windows. It's just delivered in this web interface. Now, it looks a little bit different, but it has everything. Now, I haven't configured a cluster in here. You'll notice I'm using IP addresses. That's not right either. This is a lab I'm just preparing. I've got one host that's a laptop, one host that's actually a virtual machine itself. 1.94 here is actually running as a vSphere 5.1 virtual machine with VMware tools. So let's take a look at some of the features that I like here in vSphere 5.5. Talked about two storage features, right? That uh, 62 terabyte VMDK and the uh, vSphere flash read cache. Let's see where those are. So all you do is you right click on the virtual machine, which by the way, the right click is actually pretty slick here in the web client because it's not using flash. That's important to note. Flash is not, a, not an easy task uh, to do a right click with. So basically, let's take a look at this hard disk. This particular hard disk is 62 terabytes. It's thin provisioned and I've already deployed it so I've lost the option to do that thin provisioning. Myself, I'm a fan of thin provisioning, but uh, you could do eager zero thick if you're very specific on your performance or lazy thick. Now, right next to it are a couple other great options. First of which is the IOPS. If I wanted to put an IOPS limit on this VMDK, I could do so right here. How cool is that? Then here's my other new feature, the flash read cache. I really like this one. If I've provisioned non-rotational SSD storage on a host, this particular VM can use up to, let's just say, 5 gigabytes of flash read cache. And that way, he has access to those enhanced IOP capabilities of the SSD. And I'm only going to give this VMDK 5 gig, for example. Let's say you have a SQL database that's... Uh, 5 gigabytes or maybe uh, a little bit bigger, let's be nice, 15 gigabytes. In this situation, uh, if the database fits there and it's this particular VMDK, maybe all those reads are done right from that flash read cache. How cool is that? Very granular way that you can do that. Again, not very much expense either. Now the web client's good. As you can see, I have my hosts here and they should be, let's go to the summary tab, they should be that base release that we saw from the edition chart earlier. I haven't run update manager or any updates on them yet here. So this particular host, it does indicate that this is a VMware virtual machine. I'll show you that on the other side of it, right? But basically here you can see it's build number, right? Uh, it's pretty standard. Nothing fancy. I'm still playing with the new features. I haven't upgraded this environment all the way. That's because we still have uh, a lot of stuff in my lab that is running on the previous edition of vSphere 5.1, which you can see right here. I'm logged into the 5.1 vCenter server. This is a different one. I have a lot more things going on in here, but I need to make sure that I go into my upgrade successfully. In fact, I don't even have much room to spare, as you can see. But let's take a look at those components that are in play here. So the first is the vCenter server appliance. That's the web interface that's being driven to the application and it runs on this virtual machine. So it's a pretty straightforward virtual machine if you've not deployed a virtual appliance you know, in a lab condition especially. This is the way to check it out. Um, I'm going to move fully to the web client once I go to vSphere 5.5. Simply put, some of the new features are only available in the web client. Like I won't be able to set the flash read cache here in the vSphere client for Windows. So I'm going to have to. Now, the other thing that's really cool is uh, the ESXi 5 virtual machine, which it's a defined operating system type as you can see right here in the options tab. Uh, where is it? Oh, there it is. It, guest operating system. Because it's running, I can't configure it. But basically, you'll see here that it is ESXi 5.x and listed as experimental. It is important to reiterate that running ESXi as a virtual machine is not a production class configuration. It's a great way to test it, but it's not production class. So that's a quick look inside of the lab. Hopefully this and the rest of this Backup Academy track will help you go into your vSphere 5.5 .5 upgrade successfully. 
Aside from Backup Academy, the VMware community is still very rich in additional resources for you. So here are some links to some of the ones just that I can think of off the top of my head. Of course, VMware has plenty of resources, uh, the documentation site, the blog site, as well as the, uh, the VMware community's set of uh, forum threads. But another great one from Eric Siebert is the V-Launchpad. If you haven't heard of this one, you really should check it out. It's literally a launch pad of links to all the different people and websites in the community, the compatibility guides, uh, my Veeam podcast, all kinds of stuff can be reached right here at the vSphereLand.com uh, website operated by my friend Eric Siebert. So I encourage you to check that out. Okay, well I hope this track was beneficial for you. When we talk about vSphere 5.5, it's more than just a new version with a couple of increased scale items and new features right it's a platform it's where we run our data center so hopefully covering the different versions and sequencings that are applicable to the product was beneficial to you as well as some of the features and I only scratched the surface there are so many features for vSphere 5.5 I encourage you to download the what's new PDF it has all of those features explained in highlight form as well as the release notes of the product have all of them explained in detail. Hopefully everyone learns something about the upgrade process of vSphere 5.5. The number one thing, go in prepared. Have yourself a lab either with Autolab, nested ESXi, uh, a laptop running ESXi, whatever it takes to go through the drill so that you know what you're getting into with the upgrade is the best thing you can do when it comes to upgrading your virtual environment. We took a look in my lab at a couple of different things and also some additional vSphere 5 resources that are available to you in the virtualization community. I'm Rick Vanover and I appreciate you attending this Backup Academy track. Thank you.